inside my brain, I'm running a simulation of the character's brain. And then if the character is wondering if someone else is lying, then that character's brain is running a simulation of the other character's brain. And at the same time, I'm wondering, what does the reader make of all this? Hi, my name's Jack Heath, and I'm the author of Kill Your Husbands, published by Alan and Unwin and Audible. In Kill Your Husbands, you have um, three couples, friends since high school, mostly, give or take. They all go on a holiday together for this sort of nice, unplugged retreat, um, a remote house in the mountains. And uh, on the first night, or maybe the second night, <laughs> yeah, you, you read the book and you tell me. But early on, uh, a game of truth or dare goes too far and they decide to swap partners but when the lights come back on, one of the men is dead and no one can agree who he was with or even which room he was with them in. And because their phones still don't work and now the car keys are missing, they're kind of stranded on this, um, on this mountaintop and the killer is just getting started. So it's one of those and then there were none people picked off one by one type thrillers. I've heard Benjamin Stevenson use the term standalone sequel, which I hate because it feels like a contradiction in terms. I try to write every book as though it would be the perfect point for a reader to jump in if they've never heard of me before, but also as though I'll never have the opportunity to ever write another book and, like, I'll get struck by lightning as soon as it's over. I, I don't save any powder for the next thing. But in this case, um, the police detective investigating the case, um, Kiara Louie, she appeared in one of my previous novels, which was called Kill Your Brother. But you don't need to read Kill Your Brother to read Kill Your Husbands. It's a new case, new story, whole new bunch of dead bodies and suspects. I think I have published 40 books. It's starting to get to the stage in my career where it depends how you count it. Like, there was one book I did which was self-published. Well, do you count that one? I guess. Uh, there was one which was published by a major publisher but only as an e-book. Do you count that? There was one which, um, actually, there were four that were published under the name um, Cosentino. He's a real person, the, the magician, but, but we had sort of a collaborative relationship, so I don't know if you count those. At a given point, I don't want readers to think that I'm phoning it in, to think, of, well, if he's written that many books, he can't really be putting much thought into any of them, so... I'm kind of getting to the stage where I stop counting because I don't want um, I don't want readers to think I'm a qual quantity over quality type of guy. But yeah, it's it's at least forty, and the plan is to keep going until I'm dead. Writers don't retire; they just die. <laughs> I still haven't got a system that works. I'm always trying to kind of refine my organizational strategy a bit. It, it's weird. So much of being a writer or being a successful full-time writer is not about writing but just about organization and logistics and professionalism and I'm, I'm essentially sort of running my own business and that side of things is not really the side that interests me I'd, I'd much rather be just thinking about characters and plots and settings and stuff so um, it helps that a lot of the books that I write are suggested by my publisher like one of my um, one of my most successful novels was the book 300 Minutes of Danger for kids. And that was the publisher pitched me an idea and I went, sure, I could write that. And, and that kind of took off. So I kind of like, <laughs> it's almost as though the the publisher, I uh, don't know if I should say this, but it's as though the publisher treats me a bit like chat GPT, like write me a book about this. And I go, Brr. <laughs> um, but I like to think I do it better than chat GPT does. But uh, Kill Your Husbands wasn't like that, though. Kill Your Husbands was very much my own, uh, this idea that had been kind of bubbling away in my head for a really, really long time. I used to go on holiday with my old high school friends. Um, and so we, we thought that those trips would last forever, that we'd always kind of go every year at the end of year. And of course, life doesn't work like that. Some of us got married, some of us didn't, some of us um, could afford to go to Hawaii instead. Others of us definitely couldn't. Um, some had kids, some didn't, all that stuff. So I was interested in exploring how these kind of different directions that your lives can take um, mean that when you kind of collide with not just the people you used to know, but the person you used to be, that can create friction. So I guess this is the kind of novel 
where um, it was living rent-free in my brain for a long time before I wrote it. So regardless of how I tried to do my organisational schedule, like you were saying, oh, I'll write a children's book here and I'll write an adult book here and, um, oh, that's selling well, I might want to write a sequel. I always had kind of bubbling in the back of my head, I really want to write that partner swap murder mystery. <laughs> so when I started writing this book, I had a structural problem. I knew that the first death wasn't going to be able to happen until about halfway through. So I knew the, the first chapter was going to be the police detective coming into this house, finding a dead man on the floor and then another dead man in the bed and then going upstairs and finding a, uh, a man being held at knife point by a woman. So that, that was kind of my way of, of telling the reader, OK, this is going to be this sort of um, murder mystery with a high body count but not yet. The, the way the plot was structured was that th for the first half it was just going to be these couples and I thought, OK, so how am I going to... How am I going to keep the reader engaged and on the hook um, to, to sustain that sort of um, excitement and interest long enough to actually get to the killing? And I'm a big fan of um, uh, Holly Wainwright, in particular her book um, I, I Give My Marriage a Year. That was one of my all-time favourites. And I thought, well, maybe I could sort of try to channel my inner Holly Wainwright and, and sort of uh, massage a sense of intimacy into maybe that could be what the thrill for the reader comes from, the, the sense that you're getting this sort of window into the darkest secrets of a marriage but multiplied by six because everyone has their own kind of perspective. But as soon as I started writing that, I realised I had another problem. I said to my wife, people are going to think this is us and also some of it is. <laughs> so how are we going to handle that? And my wife, who is a deeply courageous woman, said, just write the book you want to write, babe. We'll deal with that later. Don't worry about what I will think. Don't worry about what anyone will think. Just, just you know, speak your truth. And, uh, and so I did. And that meant that I was kind of egging myself on in a way. Um, I think if you can give readers a sense that they are viewing, so not just secrets, but if they can see themselves in characters who are having thoughts that they would never admit to anyone else that they had had, there's this kind of voyeuristic pleasure in it. So that, that was kind of how I tried to keep the reader on the hook for the first half of the novel. I'd love to be the, the sort of writer who has an office that looks like the sort of Hollywood crazy person set where there's, you know, a cork board and pins and string and stuff like that. In, in my case, this was a, a little bit more mechanical than that in the sense that I went, OK, I know there's going to be six characters. Uh, I know that they're going to be married to each other. So I need three women. I need three men. I need six names. I need six occupations. I was almost putting it together like a game of Cluedo, going kind of, OK, uh, here's six different potential murder weapons. Here's the different rooms of the house. And then I kind of just tried to pick the most interesting combination of killer weapon motive and because all the characters need motives for murder not just the one who actually did it you you want to kind of keep the reader guessing and sidetracked but when I was a, a kid I read a book and I won't tell you what it is because I don't want to spoil the twist but it was one of those novels where the killer turned out to be the narrator and that blew my tiny little mind when I was a kid and so I always wanted to write something like that. For this book, I thought, what if I wrote a book where the killer was the narrator and the reader knew that was going to be the case from the beginning, but they didn't know which narrator? So that meant that I needed to have these six characters all with motives that the reader was kind of privy to, but I also couldn't have any of these characters wonder who the killer was because then the reader would be able to eliminate them as a suspect. So whenever one of the characters is speculating about the nature of the crime, I always try to, or even when they're telling the truth in general, I try to make sure that scene is from the perspective of a different character so I wasn't eliminating anybody. So to answer your question, this was a very difficult uh, novel to plot, but fortunately I had help. I had really good structural editors, copy editors, proofreaders, people, uh, my publisher who would kind of nudge here or there. And quite late in the stage we switched around chapter one and chapter two, or the prologue became chapter one and chapter one became the prologue. And that was like a great decision. It was the kind of thing where um, suddenly I would see opportunities because I'm always... So I have a brain, a 
obviously. Well, maybe that's not obvious, but I do have a brain. And inside my brain, I'm running a simulation of the character's brain. And then if the character is wondering if someone else is lying, then that character's brain is running a simulation of the other character's brain. And at the same time, I'm wondering, what does the reader make of all this? So I'm thinking, what is the reader thinking about what this character is thinking about what that character is thinking? And that's the sort of thing you can't do without help because I'm not that smart. I needed other readers to kind of write in the margins, this is who I think the killer is at this point, or here I'm starting to suspect this. So as I could kind of make sure I balanced the reader's expectations just on that knife edge. The process varies book to book, um, which is probably why halfway through every book I write, I start to worry that I don't actually know how to write a book. <laughs> I always go, oh, no, what have I done? This isn't working at all. And then I have to kind of look at the 40 books already on the shelf and go, okay, this happens every time. Just remind yourself, nothing to worry about. But um, the, at a bare minimum, my agent reads it, my publisher reads it, uh, structural editors, copy editors, all, all these people. But in this case... I did something a little bit different where I was kind of giving the book to my wife one chapter at a time and uh, and she would read it of an evening and kind of make um, uh, and make comments. And so that was the main benefit of that wasn't just that she gave me useful and interesting feedback. It was also very motivating during the day. Like I would be um, I would get to my desk and go like, OK, Venetia needs something to read tonight let's put on a good show for her. And I would sort of try to write a, a chapter to sort of entertain her specifically. And then it was so gratifying, albeit a little bit distracting, uh, when we're in bed at the end of the day, I'm reading a book, but I can't focus on it because I keep glancing over it where she's up to and go, oh, she's nearly up to the bit where the, the, the hole in the ceiling and stuff. So that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I've always loved reading, which is probably obvious, but I think... When I was in year five, I went on a school excursion where we met Jackie French. And I've still got this picture of me and her. I don't remember a single thing Jackie French said to me. It was probably very wise because she's like that. But I do remember looking at her and going like, wow, you're a, you're like just, you're a human being. You're a person and I'm a person too. Maybe, maybe I could do what you do. So I think that was about the point that I started telling everyone that I was going to be a writer when I grew up. But I didn't realise that I didn't actually have to wait until I grew up, until I was about 13, when I started reading... Um, it was a book that we were set in class that I just hated. In retrospect, I think it was probably a really good book. But um, because I reacted so badly to it, um, I started wondering what kind of book I would like to read instead and sort of wrote a checklist of everything that I thought should be in a great book. And it was explosions and helicopters and kung fu and stuff like that. So I started writing my own book, um, uh, sort of, so as I had something to read. I had this plan that I would write the book. It'd take me, you know, two weeks, because how hard could that be? And then two weeks from now, I'd have a good book to read. And I was this, I would know the plot, obviously, but I was the sort of kid who reread books a lot anyway. So I wasn't averse to reading books over and over if, if they were good. And it didn't take me two weeks. It took me sort of four years. But I think um, the fact that I kept at it, that I kept kind of picking away at that debut novel um, uh, when I didn't have to. So I was doing it after school, on the weekends, during the school holidays, when um, uh, friends of mine were doing other very valuable things. But So no, no diss on them for playing sport instead or whatever. But, but the point is I didn't have to and yet I felt compelled to. I, I enjoyed the process. So... After that, I knew that I wanted to be a writer this whole time. And when the book was published and it was a big success, um, so that was The, the Lab, my, my debut novel, I thought, aha, fantastic, I've made it. Unfortunately, my second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth books didn't do nearly so well. So there were the real challenge of my career came in those dark years where I was like, okay, I'm not making any money doing this, but there's nothing else I want to do. This is how I want to spend my life. This is what I care about. This is sort of both what I value and what I'm passionate about. And I get into a flow state when I'm doing it, all that stuff that offers career satisfaction, everything except the money. <laughs> so fortunately, I eventually managed to get a job in a bookshop. So I was a bookseller for a while. And that meant that I got to meet not only 
writers. I've met plenty of writers at events over the years, but I got to meet readers and I got to see the kinds of books that they would pick up off the shelves and put back down and then compare those to the ones they would take to the counter. So, for example, I learned the importance of a, of a catchy, easily digestible premise. So there are books which are really good, they're beautifully written, the, the stories are masterful, but if readers can't kind of tell from the title and a little bit of the blurb what they're about, they just kind of won't buy them. So after that, I shifted to... I, I guess I changed what I thought was important when it came to coming up with ideas for novels. I wrote a book called Liars, which is about a kid who invents a lie detector app. There you go, I've just summarised the book. That, that was the kind of book that I wouldn't have written if it hadn't been for that job in the bookshop. And after 300 Minutes of Danger came out and did so well, I got to write 400 minutes, 500 minutes. Um, I went down from four days at the bookshop to three and then two and then one and then and then quit in 2017. I still, part of me still misses the job. <laughs> Actually, I think I still have my staff discount from my old boss. Um, I haven't reminded him <laughs> to take me off the system and he hasn't done it because I love books as, as you get. But yeah, that was, um, that was a good job, but I've been full-time writing since 2017. I wrote this book about a teenage girl who gets abducted by aliens and the aliens chop off her hand and replace it with a piece of super-powered alien technology that she then uses to murder all the aliens and free all the other slaves. It's loosely autobiographical, as you can probably tell. Um, yeah, no one wanted to publish it, but that's fine. Every book you write makes you a better writer, even if, even if no one else ever actually gets to read it. And a lot of those ideas, uh, you can't keep a good idea down. So everything that was good about that manuscript eventually managed to kind of be recycled into, into something else. So most of my failed projects, actually even Hangman, which is, um, so if, if I were to die tomorrow on my tombstone would probably be like, he's the guy who wrote that cannibal detective book. <laughs> um, that was something where I started writing in 2008. I sent it to the publisher in 2010. They didn't want it. Um, I rewrote it. They still didn't want it. I sent it to a different publisher. They didn't want it. Eventually, it just ended up in my inner drawer. And I went, OK, that was an experiment. It didn't work. But I'm glad I made the attempt. I learned a lot. So in 2016, around about there, American Blood by Ben Sanders comes out. So Ben Sanders is a Kiwi, but the book is set in America and it's very gruesome. And it was published in January of 2016 or thereabouts. And it did really well. So the following year, the publisher publishes another Ben Sanders book, Gruesome, set in the United States, written by someone from Down Under, and it does well too. And then along comes 2018 and they don't have a book to fill that time slot. And my agent remembers, hey, Jack Heath wrote a really gruesome crime novel set in the United States that we couldn't get published earlier. Um, maybe the publisher would like that to fill the slot. And they absolutely did. So partly it was a matter of just the book's time eventually came, and sometimes that happens. But it was also the case that Hangman was a very ambitious novel, and when I first wrote it, I didn't actually have the skills to pull it off. I had to write a whole bunch of other books in the meantime to learn enough about storytelling that I could make this premise work. So much. Okay, so um, I have a new series uh, called Spy Academy. The first book, The Peak, is already out, but I've just put the finishing touches on a sequel called Doomsday. So there's a kid who's a spy who fights giant bugs. There's your easy, catchable, uh, digestible premise <laughs> for that. Um, but I also have two more crime novels for adults coming out. Um, the first one at the moment is called Choppy Water. It's a murder mystery set on a cruise ship. And um, the second one at the moment, I'm calling it Sheer Drop, but I don't know a lot about it yet. I kind of need to nail book one before I can, like I said before, I, I write every book as though I'll never get the chance to write another one. So I don't do series, I only do sequels, standalone sequels. So there's that on the go. Um, I wrote a book last year, uh, just got on the notables list for the book council actually, which doesn't often happen to me, um, called If You Tell Anyone You're Next. And I've just um, signed the deal with the publisher to write another book with the same detective, this um, teenage uh, true crime podcaster. And so at the moment that's called I Know What You're Hiding. So what's that? I have a spy academy. I know what you're hiding. Two adult crime books and who knows what else. Um, hopefully I don't get struck by lightning tomorrow because I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thank you for having me here at this beautiful leaf bookshop in Ashburton. <laughs> Thank you.